We greatly appreciate it and love seeing more and more faces every year. Um, hope you guys are enjoying it. Um, today I am uh, joined by Jim Shear from SNA and Aaron Grabe from ESTA. And I'm going to turn it over to them quickly to give them give you kind of a brief, brief background and bio. And then we'll go into just discussions of all of the jobs that we've had in the industry um, and beyond and sort of different paths that you can take beyond just going on set. You can still be involved in this industry in, in a variety of ways. So take it away, Jim. Hi, I'm Jim from SNA. Uh, I started in the film industry in 1996, in the spring of 96. I was studying film at UIC, which no longer has a film program, as I understand. Um, and that was back in the day when we actually still used film. And there was a music video shooting on my street, so I contacted the location manager and said, hey, I'd love to work on set, <laughs> you know, and uh, got on set as an intern or unpaid PA, worked a 23-hour day on a music video. Uh, I learned that not all Apple boxes contain fruit on that job. <laughs> uh, from there, I dipped into other departments. I did an internship at Schumacher Camera in 1998 for a year and did some loading, uh, worked in art department, did a little bit of DGA stuff, or AD stuff, not DGA. Uh, and then eventually in 2001, I went to work for SNA, and in 2008 became an owner. So I've uh, been there 22 years this September. And explain what SNA is. Uh, SNA is uh, grip and electric equipment. Um, it's also camera support, camera dollies. Uh, Fisher and Chapman, and then we also have two sound stages, which are really geared towards commercials. Uh, we're not big enough to do TV shows and movies there. But great for commercials because you also have production space there, so you can set up your production office right off the stage, and it's kind of everything happens right there. Yeah, all the ancillary support facilities are there where, you know, a TV show will often come into a fairly raw space, and they'll bring in their bathrooms and their production offices and their other things like that. Um, we're, we're designed so that if you have a three-day commercial, you can come in, you can set up your printer, you can be operating within 10 minutes of walking in the door. Um, the bathrooms are right there, there's kitchens, There's everything's kind of built for a, a short-term rental uh, as opposed to like a you know eight-month or 10-month TV show rental. Hi, my name is Aaron Graby. I am the executive director of ESTA, which is the Entertainment Services and Technology Association. Uh, many of you, I see some familiar faces. You've stopped by the booth earlier today, so I've probably already given you the elevator pitch, and I won't do that now. Um, I started in the industry uh, as a high schooler, getting into lighting and theatrical production, um, and I've really never done anything else other than lighting since then. Um, I've done a lot of uh, live event production, corporate productions, theater, concerts, um, that type of stuff. Uh, in 2012, I, became, I, uh, I got an internship with ESTA, and in 2019, I was named the executive director of ESTA. So in the span of seven years, I went from intern to uh, running the place. Um, my background is predominantly in live event production. I have exactly one IMDB credit for film work. I have a friend uh, who runs a production company here in the, in the city, and I help them with a short. Uh, so that's kind of where I come in. Great. See, already a variety of avenues you can go down. Um, so my quick bio is uh, I went to Columbia College, Chicago. And when I graduated in 2002, there wasn't much of an industry here. So I went to LA, because um, that's what you do. And uh, I ended up interning for a cinematographer and, on a movie, um, which was great. I got a lot of onset experience and kind of jumped right into like big budget Hollywood stuff um, and got to learn a different side of things versus you know film school productions and little indie things that I did on the side here in school. Um, and then worked my way up um, both on little indie projects as a camera assistant and loader and then on big projects as a camera PA and then worked at a rental house, uh, camera rental house as well. Um, and then got in the union as a film loader and did that for a while and then just decided I didn't want to live in LA anymore. So made my way back here and after a few years of doing odd things, um, Cinespace was just opening up their studio uh, and they wanted to create a campus environment there and Chicago Fire um, was just starting their first season. 
um, and really wanted to use Keslo Camera, which only had an office in Los Angeles. So Keslo decided then to open up an office here at the Cinespace lot right around the corner. And I got hired to open it up and run it, and I've run it ever since for 11 years. So uh, yeah, I've been on set and then on the rental side. And also now, yeah, volunteering my non-existent time for Filmscape because it's important, so. <laughs> um, so I got my, my first job in the industry uh, at a local theatrical supply company. Um, as I said, I got started in lighting in high school and after high school, uh, I tried to go to college. That didn't work out too well for me right out of high school. And uh, so I went to work for the theatrical supply company and I got, I got that job by walking in and the woman behind the counter said, well, hi, what can I do for you today? And I said, I'm here to work for you. And that was enough. There was, I, there was some confidence. I had a little bit of skill and they had a, a entry level position open and I worked for that company for nine years uh, and then decided I, would, I was ready for college. So I went back to college uh, as a 29 year old and got a late in life degree in the field that I had already been working in. So I kind of came at it from a different angle, but I'm very grateful for that experience because the, the, the college curriculum did help round out some things uh, that I didn't know and also help provide a structure that I wasn't really used to. That's a good point you bring up sort of college and being ready and not. And I mean, college isn't for everybody and also it's not affordable for everybody, um, which is one of the goals of Filmscape. I know I feel like I'm just like up here publicizing Filmscape and you, are, you guys are already here, but that's sort of the point. And there are a lot of other programs um, that the city and, and, and other people within Chicago and, and Illinois are developing so that we can get more people to learn and grow this industry locally so you don't have to go to LA like I did because you know there's enough base here. And I mean, one of the, the big reason that the film industry is so big now here is because of the tax incentives. Um, and so that is what kind of switched things and, and has been that wave for the last 10, 12 years um, has changed things quite a bit. So there are different avenues. And I mean, you can go on YouTube. My friend calls it YouTube University and learn a ton there too, but really hands-on is is really important um go in yeah just walk in somewhere and see if you can help <laughs> one, of the, one of the uh sort of things i've discovered over 27 years uh is on the non-school route you know if you show a willingness to learn if you just are eager to learn there are so many people that will lend you their time they will give you their time they will teach you they will show you stuff. They'll spend time with you. You know, it, there, there's just a lot of really great open people in this in this town, in this industry that that will help you, and you know, get your foot in the door and get you on the path to, to that kind of thing. Yeah, really, it, it really is a, a craft in that way. In that, a lot of what we learn it does get passed down from person to person verbally. Um, you know, there's a a ton of great resources out there that are books and things like that that you can absorb yourself in, but there's, there's really no replacing getting that experience from people who've been in the industry and learned, and that's, uh, you know, those are gonna be some of your, your, your most valuable resources is those people in the industry that have been doing it longer than you and are at a, at a place that you'd like to be, you know? Uh, and I meant to start by saying this is a very casual, loose conversation, so feel free to raise your hand and we'll answer questions anytime. It's not like a Q and A at the end, yeah. Uh, just repeating the question first, um, talking about going up to to people and asking, you know, questions and, and advice and things. It's like you don't want it to seem like a transaction, like, yes, I need something from you, and that's why I'm coming to you. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think that part of it is um, is understanding that they need something from you, too. 
right? Their businesses aren't succeeding without a constant influx of people that are going to move through the ranks and be able to learn that business well and understand your business practices, right? There's something really valuable about somebody that's been sticking around for a while and knows something about the business. So uh, in a way, I kind of feel like it's, it is transactional, right? It, we're putting ourselves out there. We need money. They need work. So there shouldn't really be, be a fear, I guess. And it's hard to say, like, just go in there with confidence, right? Because that's not something you can just, there it goes. But you get better with it uh, as you practice. That confidence will um, maybe come off as less, I need something from you, give it to me now, and I'll give you this thing. And more like, I'm a good person, and I'm thoughtful, and I'm... Um, articulate and I'm going to look right at you and tell you what I can offer and you're going to tell me if you need that and if it's not a good fit move on and also just being open and honest about where you're coming from is fine you know if someone comes up to me and says like, hey I'm just got out of school I'm trying to figure out my path I know you might not be hiring but I'd love to pick your brain and just know more and to keep doing that even when you do get a job then keep trying to learn more and, and talk to more people. And then, it, then it'll, that's when the pressure drops off is because you're not looking for something, right? And so then if you repeat that, then you just kind of get used to having those conversations. Right, and, and you mentioned, uh, you know, how do you put yourself into those positions? You just do. You find networking opportunities and you go and you are part of it and you're doing the same thing that everybody else in that room is doing. It's a, it's a room full of strangers who are trying to figure out how do we fit together? What do, you, what do you need? What do I need? And, you know, how can we partner together? Or how can we make our businesses better? Or whatever it is. Put yourself in the room that makes those things happen. And, again, with the confidence, don't be shy in a networking opportunity to just walk up to somebody and say, my name is, who are you, what do you do? And see where it goes, right? That uh, Nine times out of ten, it's going to lead you to some cool connection that you didn't know was out there. Or it might lead, you know, you might have uh, a conversation with that person and they'll say, hey, you do this really cool thing. I don't actually need that, but I know somebody over here who does that really cool thing and let me introduce you to them. And then it just snowballs from there. That's what the networking part is all about. It, it sucks sometimes having to know somebody to get somewhere, but knowing people helps because... It, it takes all of us to do all of it, right? So we have to know each other. We have to support each other. And as you go through this industry, you'll find out that it is incestuous. You've got people from this company who then go to work for that company, and you've got freelancers who are working on all this kind of stuff. Throughout your career, you're going to keep seeing the same faces. So it behooves you to be kind, be nice to them, remember them, um, and maybe, you know, uh, as you're walking around the, the show floor, everybody should have business cards with them. Start with the business card. Don't end with the business card. Say, hi, my name is Aaron. Here's my card. You've already gotten that part out of the way. Now we don't need to have the whole conversation about how do we fit together, right? And then maybe midway through the conversation, we discover that, oh, there's this thing. Now let me give you my card. We, we buy boxes of cards, like 500 or 1,000 at a time. Give them away. Put your name out there. And I, I would just say, um, be nice, be really nice, you know, and, and don't ever badmouth somebody behind their back to anybody because you never know who knows that person. You never know who's crossed paths with that person. Just be nice, you know, and, and by doing that, you'll, you'll expand your circle and your network and, you know, you never know someday down the road, you know, there's an opportunity that somebody that you were nice to, you know, a couple years ago remembers you and says, you know what, this person that was really nice to me would be perfect for that role. And they throw your hat in the ring. You know, somebody early on in my career said to me, be really nice to people because all the people that you see on your way up, you're going to see them again on your way back down. <laughs> so, you know, just be nice. Yeah, I think that's absolutely probably the number one piece of advice. A big part too. Uh, a big part too in freelancing is personality. I mean, you can do the job, you could be good at the job, but if you have a crap personality, you don't get hired as often. It, you know, like people, they, they remember the good personality in addition to the work ethic and, and the skill set. So it, it, it's a combination of the two. You know, when you're working in an office job, 
I always tell our guys that come through at, at, at SNA, you know, when you get back out in the freelance world, um, you, you know, you're really only as good as your last job. You know, where when you're at employed full time, people are generally lazy. If somebody has to actually get off their butt and fire you, they won't do it unless you're really, really, really bad, right? But if you're freelance, if you're just so-so and there's somebody else that's a little bit better, you know, then they just don't call you anymore. It, it, it's not, you know, like your phone stops ringing. So, you know, be nice. And the other bit of advice that I would give, and this is sort of not necessarily specific to the film industry or the technology industry, or it's really in almost anything you do. And this is something that was drilled into me by some, some really important people and mentors in my life. But um, in terms of the work ethic, early is on time. On time is late. Late means you're fired. Drill that into yourself, make it a thing, and apply it to every obligation that you have in your career. That little extra being prepared when the clock strikes, whatever the minute is it's supposed to strike, where you start work, be that person. So the question was about networking and how you sort of capitalize on that connection that you make and, and go forth to help the other person out. Yeah. So uh, email works, right? If, you, if you've had a conversation with somebody and you say, oh, I'd really like to introduce you to this person, let me, let me do that. When we leave here, I've got your card, I'll email you later. So if you say... And for, if, if you say you're going to do it, do it. And then there's a weird timing thing, in my opinion, that happens. I'm going to take a lot of business cards away from this trade show. It's Saturday. I'm not going to go home on Saturday night and email all of you and say, it was really nice to meet you at Filmscape. Here's the action items we talked about. That email is going to get lost by Monday morning. And also, if you think about from the, at least on the exhibitor side, um, you know, we're going to be going back to our shops, we're going to be going traveling back, and we're going to be catching up on email from the days that we were out. And uh, maybe I'm not going to do it right away on Monday morning, but I'm going to do it like, it's kind of like this weird, like, uh, you know, when do you call somebody after the first date thing? It's like, when does the perfect moment? I don't know that there is a perfect moment, but it's not immediately after you leave. And it's not first thing AM on the next business day. There's like a sweet spot because I don't know, there's, there's something to be said for how the information gets delivered. I don't know if that really answers your question. Yeah, so, like, my friend has a right friend, right? He uses Facebook Messenger. I've made that connection with him, but he doesn't ah. So the next thing would be a, a well-written email that says, Dear Person A and Person B, Person A, please meet Person B. Person B, please meet Person A. Person A is this to me and the world. Person B is this to me and the world. And I wanted to pair you together because we talked about this really cool thing that you both do. Have at. I would also say, you know, ask kind of open-ended questions so that it gives them an opportunity to sort of, you know, give you their idea of what this interaction is going to be and give you their sort of thoughts of how you might work together and how you might both capitalize on that, that relationship going forward. And also uh, in that email, right, you're going to, both of the, the people are going to be on there and they're going to then like hopefully have a conversation that carries on. And at some point you can either stay on the email thread to stay abreast of what's going on and what they're talking about, or you can say, hey, it looks like you guys have found your niche and you're carrying on your conversation, you can take me off the CC now, you know? Or if you don't see that reply, then you would follow up with the person you know better and say, was there an email that happened? Did you guys actually go and talk and just not CC me or what happened? And if it didn't happen, then maybe you poke the topic again a week later and say, putting this back up to the top of your inbox, did you guys have a chance to talk? You know, and then you're also, 
showing diligence and ethic by following up and making sure that this thing you said you wanted to do got done. Uh, so getting back a little bit to sort of career choices and things, Jim, when you graduated from school, what, what did you want to do? Did you want to be a gaffer? Did you something Don't we totally all different? want to be directors? I mean, <laughs> come on. No, I think I was the only one who didn't in my classes. <laughs> I, I, uh, I think I was more confused at the end of school than I was at the beginning. Um, I, I would say that you know I started freelancing as a PA while I was going to UIC, um, so I would you know it was pretty lackadaisical uh, class attendance there. Um, you know I mean it's art school so uh, but um, so I I ended up with some experience in the industry, PA and you know commercials and and uh, and music videos. A tiny, tiny bit on, on TV shows, you know, like day play here and there. But um, back then, it was, a, it, was, it was a pretty different industry than it is now, too, um, in, in terms of how long the days were. Um, PAs were, were pretty readily abused. Um, so, you know, it's just a different, different kind of environment. So by the time I got done with, with uh, school, I was already pretty established as a PA. I, I was doing a little bit of art department and, and some other stuff. Um, and then I went and did the internship at Schumacher thinking I'd, I'd want to do camera and, and I did load magazines for a while, um, you know, back when there was film. Uh, so did that. I kind of realized after about six months to a year of, of doing a little bit of that and a little bit of PA and that it probably wasn't my career path. Um, it just it didn't feel right, didn't feel like a good fit. So I dipped back into like art department and uh, a little bit of AD and I still PA'd once in a while. And then I was at SNA uh, working on a job, and Wayne Kubaki, who uh, was my former partner, he retired in 2019. Um, he was familiar with me, you know. I mean, everybody gets familiar with each other in those in those environments. He came up to me and asked me if I'd be interested in coming to work for SNA, and this was uh, summer of 2001. And I had never really thought of taking a staff position anywhere, to be perfectly honest. I was like. Well, I don't know, <laughs> you know. So we continued the conversations, and uh, eventually I did go to work for SNA. Um, my first day was September 10th, 2001. Uh, so I, I do remember that day uh, and the next day. Um, and I, I, I honestly thought I'd be there for maybe three to five years, you know, and then dip back into freelance again. You know, I did like the freelance sort of environment, but I was able to thrive at SNA. It, it just it, it fit my abilities. So it was kind of accidental, but um, you know sometimes those are the best things. You know, um, I'm pretty good with my hands, so I can I can weld and I can fabricate things. So you know, like oftentimes people will be on the stage and they'll be trying to do something, and and we'll go back in the shop together and invent something and make it happen. You know, so um, and that stuff feels really good. You know, when you can help somebody accomplish what they're trying to do in that in that way. You know. Um, so yeah, I mean, 22 years later, uh, I'm still there, <laughs> you know, and but I was, like I said, probably more confused at the end of school than I was at the beginning. <laughs> yeah, the the thing that I find working on set versus working, you know, in a more office environment that's that's supporting set is it's quite varied work. I mean, yes, on set you're kind of every day trying to figure out, okay, how we're going to set up this shot, even though it may seem pretty standard. It's a different environment, different location. So there are all these factors that change. So it, it, it is interesting. That's the, what keeps it engaging. But working, you know, in the environments that we're working, we're troubleshooting, yeah, helping, helping clients figure out how to rig things up or set things up or figure out, you know, what they're going to be doing on set with it creating things, welding, yeah, we're making things in my shop too, and so it's, it, yeah, it, it's like, I'm not, you know, it's not as creative of a position, I guess, you know, on the surface, right, I'm not a cinematographer, that's what I went to school for, um, but I feel like I get to be creative in a lot of problem solving, um, and then I'm still apply, applying all my technical skills uh, every day to questions that people have and 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 figuring out gear and, and all of that stuff so I guess when people ask like you know every, it's glamorous to be on set even though it's tough work <laughs> I don't know how glamorous it really is but it seems like that from the outside 
and working, you know, staff at a rental house or it just, it doesn't sound appealing. It doesn't sound attractive. Um, but that's kind of why it is, I think, for me. And it sounds like for you is just every day is different. I was just going to say, too, one of the things I like the most about working at the rental house is I get to work with all the freelance people that I got to know and worked with as a freelancer. So, and they're all my friends, you know, they're all just great people and I enjoy their time and their company. And, you know, a, a lot of them, you know, we go out and have drinks after work sometimes, you know, not all the time, but um, getting to work with so many talented, creative people, uh, you know, on a daily basis and every day it's a different person. You get to bounce in and out of all these different circles. It's pretty fulfilling. Yeah, I think uh, there's some uh, something to be said for the glamorousness. I think that's the thing that other people can connect to, people that are outside the industry, your family members, your friends who don't really understand everything that you do. But if you say, oh, I worked on this thing, and they know that, they've seen that show or they've seen that movie, that makes it really palpable. So I think there's there's that allure, right? And 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 I see the same thing in the film industry as I do on the live event side. Everybody who's going to school wants to be a lighting designer. They want to be a sound designer. They want to be a set designer. They want to be the person in charge of the creative role. There are very few of those jobs out there, right? You're not going to come out of school and be a cinematographer. You're going to have to go hone your skills that you just got out of school in the industry and refine your craft and get to new levels of your career, right? Uh, the question was about breaking into writing for TV in Chicago. And uh, it's not my territory, but uh, yeah, I, as far as I know, there aren't any writing rooms in Chicago. And, and I think the thing is, is that a lot of these, you know, all the TV show, uh, most of the TV shows that are filmed here, they're actually, you know, they, they kind of start in L.A., right? Dick Wolf's production company is there. He has his writers set up there. He has his post set up there. So it's tough because you have, you know, kind of the, the executives in charge, the showrunners coming from outside. We're trying to make it, you know, available for, you know, opportunities for people to develop here. So uh, Work in Progress was a TV show um, that, finished a few years ago, but um, that's like a Chicago, 100% Chicago production. Um, so the creators and writers from here um, and created that here. So it's, it's tough um, because so many, you know, the eyes are more on LA or New York, um, but there is work being done by um, the IPA, the Illinois Production Alliance, is sort of like the, the, lobbying group and and support network to help try to um, keep the tax incentives alive and get more people to pay attention to Chicago and show off our talent. So there are going to be some efforts coming up soon, once the writer's strike is over, um, to really get more eyes on Chicago and hopefully build that up. And, and But it, yeah, I'm sorry. I wish there was more writing here, you know? So yeah, those were good, you know, good thoughts to just get on set and, and learn about the process more. Um, but I don't have better advice. It, sorry, just one sec. It's been an incredibly slow buildup to the level of production that we have now. Um, episodic never, ever stuck in Chicago. I mean, going back to the late 90s, you had like um, early edition and some of those shows, you know, that they were one and done, you know, like one season gone and they just never hung on. Um, it really wasn't until Dick Wolf started Chicago Fire here. Even uh, we had uh, Pan Am and the Playboy Club, you know, before that. Um, it was, you'd get a couple of big movies every other season, every other year. And it was commercials, and you know you had a lot of a lot of you know commercial advertising agencies uh, in Chicago, based in Chicago, 
and local commercial production companies. A lot of those are gone now, um, but the level of episodic that has risen up is building up all the ancillary stuff. So it'll come. I mean, the writing will come. It's just, you know, all of a sudden it's like, well, we have a hole here. We need to start developing this. You know, we have a hole here. We need to start developing this. So it's been, you know, in the 27 years I've been doing this, it's just been a slow build up to this point. And the level of production that we have nowadays is like head and shoulders above what we used to do even 15 years ago. Yeah, so the question was kind of more of a, a, a pathway that's less uh, physical and, yeah, sorry, I'm trying to <laughs> explain. I, I have an answer for you, but I'm trying to explain for the live streaming audience <laughs> where you're coming from, but sort of a, yeah, different path. So uh, what you're describing as far as um, data management, I, I mean, you're actually describing the digital loader. Uh, well, and then leading up to the DIT. So digital loader is taking the footage on the cards that's shot and then putting it into computer and putting in, and offloading it onto drives and then sending it off to post to process the data or to get dailies ready and, um, and edit. And then leading, you know, stepping up from that, either you can go through the camera department, but if you want to be more kind of processing data and stuff, yeah, digital, you, or, DIT um, would be working with the with that as well, and maybe doing live color grading on set and kind of manipulating the things for for on set. So maybe that's a a path for you. There's definitely a lot more of that kind of thing that happens on set now. I mean, when I started out, um, they had these little uh, video taps that just came off the eyepiece, basically, and they were really only useful for framing. You couldn't use them for lighting, you couldn't use them for anything else. It was just like, how does the framing look and is the client happy, <laughs> you know? Um, but nowadays, they actually do some color grading and they'll even ask for a, a quick edit sometimes here and there. So it's it's a lot lot more of that kind of stuff that you might be able to dig your, dig your hands into. So it's it's the you're it's a member of the camera department. So it and it is a local 600 role. If you're union, obviously you can do non-union work doing the same thing. Um, but yeah, it's kind of it's the best sort of entry into the camera department, the digital version of what we did <laughs> with film. But yeah. The question is uh, how to take the next step after an internship, to take that internship and turn it into a job, right? Um, I mean, my path, um, I just worked my butt off, so I'm trying not to swear. Um, <laughs> um, I just worked really hard to prove that I could do what was being asked of me um, and got to know people and was nice to them and just made relationships so then they wanted to hire me um, you know it was an unpaid internship and and I didn't think I could continue doing it I couldn't afford to do it for very long but 
Um, they really begged me to stay and stick it out and so figure it out kind of ways to do it. And then right after that, then they were able to hire me kind of as a camera PA, which was essentially the same position, but now like sort of legit, although that's not an official local 600 position. So it's, <laughs> um, so it's just kind of keeping, keeping open to any opportunities and it, and it might not be the direct path for what you want, but anything is then going to have you learn more. Um, so hopefully, yeah, that's, you just have to prove yourself. That's what the internship is for to learn and to kind of prove who you are and what you can do. Yeah, I would just add um, I, that you're absolutely right. Prove what you can do, but be the person that sort of set yourself apart somehow. Find the weird niche things that are like, you know, the bane of that particular position's existence and be an expert in that thing. Um, you know, in, in the live event side, something that would set people apart, a technician apart from others, is like being aware of standards that are, that are applicable to your industry or to, applicable to your job. Um, so if there are standards applicable in what you're doing, if there's guidance coming from the industry, be aware of that guidance because it's coming from people who know what they're doing. And so if you uh, can become an expert in those things, you'll set yourself apart. So taking yourself after internship, uh, you know, obviously if you have to be good at what you do in order to stick around. So there's that, you have to be good. Um, but if you can set yourself apart, I think that that would be my advice is find that thing that makes you different or find that thing that, that you know how to do better than the other people on set and, and express what your intentions are to the people that would be able to move you up because you'll never get what you want if you don't ask for it. Nobody's going to be a mind reader and say, I know you really want to be a camera loader, so why don't you come be a camera loader? You have to say, I'm a PA or I'm doing whatever it is that I'm doing on set, but I'd really like to be a camera loader. Can I go shadow somebody for a little while or can I go learn that thing because that's really cool? And that'll make people remember you. I would say the other thing too is anticipate. Learn how to anticipate. You know, like when you see, when you're working with somebody, you know they're going to ask you for the 10 millimeter wrench. Don't necessarily have the 10 millimeter wrench in your hand, but have your hand near it so when they ask for it, you're there. You know, and, and learn the jobs around you so that you can anticipate because that just makes you super useful to everybody around you and makes the workflow go well and um, helps everybody out. And people notice that. Yeah, the question was about um, sort of the lack of, uh, of anything for wardrobe and costume design for learning and opportunities here in Chicago. So uh, as far as Filmscape goes, each year we're growing and growing and adding disciplines. So we've added, um, we've, we, in the past we've done like uh, special effects makeup. We've started adding, you know, props and where there's a class about distressing um, things. So we, it, and it originated as just a grip and electric kind of show. And then as it became kind of a full show, I came on board to bring in the camera side of things. And then we just, and then we added budgeting and adding, you know, some legal stuff. And so every year we're trying to add more and absolutely wardrobe and costume is, is vital. Um, I know that there was, um, there's a costume shop that's just opening up down the street um, so I'm hoping that that's an indication that there's going to be a little bit more um, as far as resources go that we can tap into. Um, yeah, 
So I will, I will make a note to try to have a class and, and get them over here to do that. So everything is important, right? I mean, this is such a collaborative industry and there are so many avenues that you can take to be a part of this industry. And, you know, it's not going to look great if the costumes don't look good, if the lighting sucks, you know, if the set design isn't great. Um, so all of those things come together and yeah, we're trying to do more of that and hopefully other organizations will help push that along too. Yes. Uh, the question is about sort of preparing to move out to LA if that's what you're going to do because it seems like a lot of people move out there but then come back here pretty quickly. Um, I so when when I went out there, I was um, I did the Columbia College semester in LA program and it was set up to just sort of like ease you into that to say, okay, well Chicago works a little bit differently, um, and also you're just coming out of school. Um, and here's kind of more of the studio system and, and, and how things operate there. So it was just kind of trying to guide us into that. Um, I, I left because I didn't want to live in the city because I enjoy riding my bike and taking the train everywhere I go. It was nothing to do, I was very successful. So it was nothing to do with that. My husband as well, we were both doing well in our careers, but we chose lifestyle over career. Um, so that's a big thing is a lot of people like LA just isn't for them or New York isn't for them or Chicago isn't for them. It's, it's kind of finding your path. But I always tell people if they're thinking about it, go try and do it. And then if you don't like it, then come back or go somewhere else. Um, so I think that that's a bit of it. The other thing is it's just a huge industry out there and you have a lot more people. So there's a lot of competition. So I mean, like Aaron was saying, not everybody can be, you know, the head lighting designer or the production designer or whatever. Um, but there are a lot of roles to fill in. So, it, you know, Chicago's just everything's kind of shrunken down here, but, but growing. Um, so there are a lot more opportunities here. So you don't have to feel like you have to leave. Um, but I wouldn't, I, I mean, just my experience and, and other people I know's experience, I wouldn't say that uh, any of those people weren't prepared to work in LA. It was just more of a, a personal choice kind of a thing. question was asking for networking icebreakers and then how to use that to move the conversation forward. I'm a big fan of being direct. <laughs> so my icebreaker might be, hi, who are you? I like to start with a dad joke. <laughs> uh, I honestly feel like I'm always very unsure about how to go into networking situations, even to this day. Um, some days I feel more confident and just feel like walking up to people I don't know all the, you know all night long. And other nights I'm like, eh, waiting for someone to come to me. So I would just say, be yourself, be nice, just be open, be open to ideas, be open to the conversation, you know. And if all that fails, then dad joke. <laughs> and also, know when to exit the conversation. That is one of the biggest ones because. Let's take um, yesterday, for example. We had a two-hour networking event uh, at the Mars Brewing community downtown. It's two hours long. There's a room full of people. You have exactly two hours to try to meet as many of these people as you can. So that's why I'm a big fan of being direct. Hi, who are you? Get to the, let's get to the point. Here's what I do. What do you do? Do we have anything left to talk about? If yes, exchange info. If no, move on. 
there's there's no there's nothing wrong with I mean you were at a networking event there's nothing wrong with saying okay thank you it was really nice to meet you I've got a room full of people that uh, other people that I need to go meet so timing it's time like manage your time if you know you have a set amount of time manage that time and don't be afraid to say it was really nice to meet you I'm moving on and I think on the other side of that when if there's someone I know I want to get to know um I might actually try to just be their friend kind of you know just like talk casually with them you know maybe find out something that they're interested in or just be listening for those points and maybe you can connect on a personal level and then that breaks the ice too and then it, it sets you apart as sort of someone else that maybe they want to talk to not just one of the many people that wants you know their ear and, it, and, and it's a skill. I mean, converse, having a conversation is a skill. You need to know what those lead, leads you're looking for, what those ends you're looking for are. Um, you need to know, like, what uh, you're going, like, what they're going to anticipate. You know, what anticipating what they're going to say, and uh, taking the cue and knowing what the next question should be. If you're, you know, if 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 they say something about a town, you know. Or, you know, if, if the conversation's drifting along and, you, you know, you don't necessarily have to have small talk. You don't have to then move on to, well, where are you from? You know, it's a, it's a business event. So keep the business to the business unless you're, unless you're vibing with somebody and, you know, being their friend and having a good conversation, at which point, you know, then have that conversation. The question was, what do we look for on resumes? That's tough. That's tough. I mean, you're looking for so many things. You're looking for honesty. You're looking for, you know, uh, qualifications. You're looking for if there's a degree, where's the degree from? Is it related to the field? If not, does it? You're looking for those qualifications. I personally am a big fan of a more concise resume. Uh, keep your resume to one page. If somebody asks you for more, you can give them your full CV and say, here's everything I've ever done. But keep it concise so that I can pick, pinpoint the few key things. But I'll be very honest with you. I, I take resumes for with a grain of salt. If I see some of those key things that you've expressed that are, that are talents and skills that I need, then I'll move on to the interview phase. And my interview process is really more about asking you what you're good at so that I can figure out if what you're good at fits with what I need. Um, so the resume, I, you know, I don't know, it's, it's tough. Uh, you know, there may be a pile of them. How do you pick out, you know, how do you stand, how do you make your resume stand out? It's really about the skills that you have. And certainly on your resume, you should be not embellishing, but sell yourself. Do not sell yourself short. Be sure to say everything about that. Don't be humble on your resume. That was the best advice I had, was don't be humble. If you did that cool thing, talk about that cool thing, list all of it in detail with, you know, elevated vocabulary that comes from that field, if you need to. I, uh, beyond what you would expect, yes, you know, education, your previous jobs, stuff. I want to know what other things you did. Don't think that I only want to know anything that was related to camera or movie production. If you worked in a rex restaurant, you go way up on my list because I know you can deal with difficult customers. I can deal, you can deal with a fast paced environment and those skills are useful to any job that you do. If you have, you know, have skills working with your hands, working with tools. Maybe you helped your dad or your mom like at home building things with your hands and it, it goes a long way, especially because in the rental house, yeah, I mean, not, not everybody is kind of getting their hands, hands on with the cameras and fixing things, but it's a small, I mean, there are nine of us 
So everybody, if you want to, yeah, I want you to get involved in that. Um, I also just think that that's, that helps with your mindset of just knowing how to kind of fix things. You know, it's just troubleshooting, that sort of thing. So I want to know that stuff. And people always leave that off and they spend a lot of time, especially just out of school, half of the resume is all the student productions they work on. And I think that's great that you were working on all of that but they don't mean anything to me. I don't need to list, you have them listed out. I, I assume you were working on a bunch of productions in school, so you don't have to list that stuff out. It's more the skills, just think about what skills in general make you who you are and, and why you would be good at a role, not just because you know that sort of thing, you know, just in general, why you're a good, solid candidate. Yeah. And also with your with your resumes, do not be afraid to uh, let other people look at them before you are giving them. Let 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 your former boss look at it and say, "What do you think? Does this sum up what I did while I was employed with you? You know, does it does it succinctly put it? Does it list everything? Is there something else I forgot?" Um, but don't be afraid to let other eyes onto that resume because they're going to see the typos, they're going to see the rambling sentence, they're going to see the weird spacing and the change of font between paragraph one and two. They're going to see all that stuff that you don't see because you've been staring at it for too long. I, I would second what uh, Colette said completely. And, uh, you know, tell me about all the other stuff. Um, and if you're going to list a production that you worked on because it was something really cool that you did on that one, talk all about that one production. Don't list 50 of them, <laughs> you know? Um, I always tell people when they call and ask, I, I tell them, you don't have to send a formal resume. Just send me a one page of what you've been doing the last few years, you know? I want to know what you're like as a person, you know? Because I've got to work with you. <laughs> yeah, the cover letter is kind of more important. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I like to then make notes on the points that I want to bring up if I am going to bring you in as, for an interview. That's helpful, but... Yeah, it's more getting to know you because there are going to be a lot of candidates that are kind of on par, probably. So who's going to fit in right with the team? Yeah, I think the cover letter is absolutely a place that you can sell yourself more, be completely not humble, be completely forthright, throw names out. I met you through so-and-so. Uh, my friend is so-and-so. You know, throw everything into the cover letter and then show it to other people before you give it away. Uh, but a good cover letter, I, I'm pretty sure that's why I got my job. I think there was someone in the back. Sorry, it's a little dark. Yeah. <laughs> So the question was uh, uh, just to give an example about anticipating needs on set, as Jim was talking about before. I would say, you know, if you know the situation, you know the environment, there are cases where it's okay to have that wrench in your hand already. But, um, you know, sometimes you can be presumptuous, you know, and, and you want to just, you know, like, be ready, anticipate what's next, but don't start stepping that direction too far in case they're going to about to ask you something different, you know? Um, and if you're, you know, like if you're a PA or something or, or you're in a different department, people get territorial in departments sometimes, you know, like I know you need that Apple box, but I'm going to let you grab it, you know? Um, so it's, there's a, there's a fine line to, to ride there, I guess, um, you know, on that anticipation. It's always great to just be super aware of your surroundings and, and know what's going on around you. And if you see somebody, you know, is about to walk into a C stand and knock a light over or something like that, help them out, of course, you know. Um, or if you if that stand is already tipping, grab it, you know. Um, but uh, but generally speaking, it's it's just you know, it's tempering wanting to be helpful without stepping on toes. Yeah, that's exactly not being a know it all, right? I think is part of it because. If you know you know how to do that person's job, you don't need to prove it at every single step. I think that's what part of the hesitation is. Is like, you know, if you if you are constantly saying, turn, if somebody's constantly turning around, you have exactly what they need. Uh, you might come off as a know-it-all. Might it might be a little too much. We had a question over here.
The question was if it's important to have a, a creative, well-designed resume, just as opposed to a straightforward, traditional one. I don't know how important it is, especially because a lot of the resumes I'm looking at might be coming from various avenues. They might be coming from Indeed or our, you know, I'm word of mouth. I'm talking, if I'm hiring, I'm reaching out to various people in the local industry um, and asking if they, if they know of anybody or they recommend anybody and then getting them to send me a resume. So I'm already seeking them out. Um, however, if there's one that pops, yeah, sometimes it, it helps to just like, oh, that's fun. Let me look at that. And I think it depends on what you're applying for too. Like if that design kind of mattered, you know, if you're applying for something that was, that that catered to, yeah, sure. But I think for me, it's uh, less important that it be well designed and beautiful and creative and it smells pretty and all that stuff. It's less about that than it is just it not being really bad. <laughs> it can't look like you just opened up a Word document and started at the top and you didn't change any formatting and you didn't change the default font and you didn't and you don't know what a carriage return is or spacing in between the lines. Like it can't look like you just opened up a document and typed out everything and then sent it along. It you should have it should look like you know how to write. It should look like you know what punctuation is. It should look like you know general things about being, you know, a, a young professional in your starting out your career. It's less about it being pretty or having a crazy design or being a different color. Maybe in some markets or some jobs like that may be different if I've got, but I'm not dealing with a thousand resumes. If I, if I have a job posting, it's like I get, you know, 50 maybe. There was someone, yeah. Uh, the question is about kind of highlighting niche roles or roles people might not know about in the industry. Hmm. <laughs> Production coordinator we got right here. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Special effects, pyro, that kind of stuff. As somebody who has, uh, has had an Illinois explosives license, I, I'm a big fan of pyro. Um, but you don't want uh, the person who dabbles in it to be doing it, right? So I, so I no longer do pyro as a hobby because <laughs> just for fun. Um, so I don't know, that kind of stuff, I, I don't think you hear about that too much. That would be one. And that comes from somewhere else. It comes from somebody who just does pyro and now wants to do it for movies because they know how. I, I don't know. I. Uh... I feel like this industry has, you know, obviously developed over over a hundred years now, and um, and every role, while unique, is incredibly important. It, you know, it, it's always, it, you know, you don't think about it until the job is done. Like every single person performed an absolutely crucial thing on that job. So. I don't know. I think they're all important, to be honest, and I think they're all, you know, noticeable, at least within the industry. Um, you know, when you're on a job, not every job needs pyro, but when you're on a job that needs pyro, you need somebody that knows how to do pyro. <laughs> you know, um, coordinators are absolutely linchpins. You know, I, I mean, the production department, you know, production managers, production coordinators, and PAs. PAs don't get enough respect. Um, I, uh, I'm a big proponent of people that treating PAs well, and they're the glue that holds production together. So, you know, um, I think everybody's really important on set. I think there are some, I mean, niche things that kind of come about related to equipment, too, um, that just sort of, it, obviously, equipment is evolving a lot. So the example I'm going to bring up is kind of antiquated equipment. But when I was camera PAing, interning camera PAing, I was working with the same crew a lot, and that uh, DP used hot gears, um, which was a remote head system. Um, so you can repeat your shots. 
And, but he used it just all the time because he used a crane a lot and we would, you know, crane into shots. And so we would just have it there so you could be, um, you could be operating the camera from down below. And so I just learned how to manage that system. Um, and we did a lot of visual effects shots. So we did a lot of repeating the same movement and layering, you know, animals or, you know, things that would be animated later in front of the screen. Um, and so because of that, then we went and did a commercial and because it was just a short commercial, I was able to get hired as the hot gears tech. And, you know, at the time I was just working as a camera PA making a hundred dollars a day or whatever. And now I'm on, on this set making, you know, five, $800 a day, just because I had that little skill. Um, so it's, I think it's more o keeping your eyes open to that. And a lot, a lot of it does just have to do with whatever technology is existing right right then so yeah I think that goes back to what I was saying earlier about setting yourself apart is knowing that little thing like if you know at least in the lighting world the only way to really be uh, at the top of your game is to know networking now right everything is just net you're you are a network engineer now you need to know your subnet mask you need to know everything about how to you know have a, a VPN or you know networking network boxes together you know that's that's something that i never would have seen coming as as a starting out as a lighting technician yeah. well our time is up but we'll still be here to answer any questions and there's a party starting out in the hallway too so thank you all so much for coming and for all your lovely questions thanks everybody what does a nosy pepper do gets jalapeno business Ending with a dad joke. Perfect.